Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Illinois Conference on Interfaith Collaboration. I hope you're as excited and uh, nervous and uh, giddy as we are um, for, for tonight and for this entire weekend. My name's Ross Wantland. I work at uh, the uh, Office of Diversity and Social Justice Education and uh, the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations at the university here. It is a really long title. Um, but we're really, we're really excited uh, to be um, part of sponsors of, of tonight and of everything that's going to be going on this weekend. Um, this, the session that you're going to see tonight, it's a real labor of love for all of the individuals and organizations that have been involved in putting this together in, um, in advertising it in, um, in soliciting workshops and putting workshops together. Um, this is our campus's response to the White House's Interfaith and Community Service Campus Challenge. It was released last spring. And our local, our local response, the Illinois Interfaith and Community Service Challenge, has, uh, has over the past year performed uh, interfaith dialogues on first Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month around a variety of topics from questions of uh, gender and interfaith to um, how interfaith movements have really led social justice and civil rights movements over the past century, um, and talking about a variety of things that are critical to how we engage in interfaith collaboration, but also, um, as you're seeing up here, a variety of service projects on campus and throughout our community. And uh, this, this conference is, is no different. It continues that, that tradition. This conference, I have to say, couldn't have been possible without a number of organizations. The Student organiza Organization uh, Resource Fee, SORF, Student Cultural Programming Fee, the Program Coordinating Council, Diversity Ed, Interfaith in Action, the Religious, Religious Workers Association, Office of Volunteer Programs, Interfaith Youth Corps, Illini Fighting Hunger, McKinley Presbyterian Church, Central Illinois Mosque and Islamic Center, Campus Recreation, and the Hillel Foundation. And I also have to recognize um, Anna, Associate Vice Chancellor Anna Gonzalez, who is sitting there in the back, who, um, who has really, as the Director of the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations, really made this possible. Um, and, and I also um, would like to recognize our, our still new Chancellor Phyllis Wise, who is going to come up and say a few words um, to welcome us here, but also who's, without whose um, vision for what this campus could be and what this campus can be in terms of a welcome and inclusive environment, I don't think that we'd have the foundation that we have to build this conference upon. So I'd like to bring Phyllis up to say a few words. So. Well, I'll make my comments really short because I know that you have a important and full evening in front of you. But I just want to say thank you very, very much for coming and working so hard this weekend. I can't think of three more wonderful words than interfaith, collaboration, and service. In this uh, day and age when people are trying, it seems that people are trying to separate and isolate themselves from exchange and interfaith issues. It's really wonderful to see a community come together. It's particularly wonderful to see it come together on a university campus because so often interfaith is put off until later in your life and isn't thought of while you are still young and while you're still de developing your beliefs. And so for the University of Illinois to partake this way in um, response to the president's call to action in this area is really, really wonderful. Tolerance is something that we should all learn, that we can never, ever give up on, that we can never say we've been there and done that, because it is something that always needs our unrelenting attention. Collaboration is another word, I think, that is so important, because today, again, individuals get very little done, and it's only when you work with a team of people that you really have an impact. And it is those large voices that when they come together become so much louder that make things really change and make us be able to make progress. And finally, the word service. What could be more important in this time when generosity and dedication and action together to make sure that people who are not as fortunate as we are get some of the benefits of our giving back. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for all that you're going to do today. And I'm really, really sorry that I can't stay for the whole evening and for the whole weekend because I've been 
triple booked tonight. So I'm going to go on and give yet another talk. But thank you so much for coming and so much for being here. Thank you, Chancellor Wise. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit about what, what um, we're going to do tonight and a little bit about what this conference is, is going to do. Um, so we've got um, this weekend, well, actually, let me tell you the bad news, if you haven't heard yet. Ibu's not coming. I'm sorry. You hadn't heard? Okay, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not making a joke. Um, so uh, Ibu Patel's flight was delayed. Um, we had some information on the registration as people came in. Um, Jim Wallace is still here. Jim Wallace from Sojourners is going to be um, giving uh, – He's going to talk to an empty chair. That's going to be the talk for tonight. No, it's going to, it's going to, uh, has, has a lot to tell us and talk to us about interfaith collaboration and what that means from his perspective and his work in Sojourners. So, um, so we've got some wonderful speakers that are with us this weekend. We've got Jim Wallace from Sojourners. We've got Valerie Carr from the Groundswell Movement, who's going to be speaking on Sunday as our closing speaker. We've got Chris Stedman from the Harvard uh, Humanist Chaplaincy, who's going to be talking about atheists engaging in interfaith work. Um, we've also got some amazing workshops this weekend that are presented by and for students to, to talk about what are some of the critical issues on college campuses that we need to engage in and, and what are some of the tricks and tips that we may learn and we might be able to share out with each other. So we've got students who are coming from campuses all across the Midwest to join together, as well as staff from across the Midwest. One of the things that I learned as I started to become more involved in interfaith work is that I didn't have the language. As someone who worked on a college campus, I wasn't taught the language to engage in conversations around religious diversity. And so how do we increase all of our literacy around interfaith dialogue? Um, and finally, uh, and um, one of the things that I think we're, we're very, very proud of, tomorrow afternoon we're going to have a service event where we're packaging 30,000 meals for local residents who um, are, uh, um, are uh, suffering from um, uh, food in instability, not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. And so we, we've got a really exciting moment to not only come together and package these meals and to talk about some of the real underlying issues of hunger, um, but also what is it that our faith perspectives and our, our philosophical perspectives have to say about that? What is it, how can we come together and understand why do I believe it's important to serve my community? And how does that come out of some of the things that I believe and some of the things that I know? Um, so it's going to be a really amazing weekend, and we're really glad that you've joined us. Um, I, uh, to, one of the things that we're going to be doing tonight um, before Jim's talk is we're going to have an opportunity for reflections, and this is going to be throughout the weekend. We're going to have a reflections from people from different faith and philosophical backgrounds to talk about why interfaith collaboration is important to them. And um, to, to start us off with that, um, we have our own Tim Bossenbrook here who's going to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Ross, and uh, the whole committee for inviting me to do this. I've been sitting on the committee as a liaison with the Religious Workers Association. Uh, I myself am the pastor of Hessel Park Christian Reformed Church, a local church here in town. And that church is part of the Calvinist tradition uh, of the Christian church, and more particularly the Dutch Calvinist or Reformed tradition. In fact, I first heard Jim Wallace speak many years ago at Calvin College when I was about, well, I was going to say your age, but um, there's a lot of community folks here, which is great. So when I was a senior in college is when I first heard Jim Wallace speak, and he was probably about my age. So uh, he was on his uh, Let Justice Rule Tour. And justice is the first reason I'm involved in interfaith work. But let me explain that because my motivations are a bit more complex than just the pursuit of justice. One key aspect of the Dutch Reformed expression of the Christian faith is the belief that our core faith commitments, those things that we put our trust and hopes and desires in, shape and form a whole set of assumptions about the world, a set of assumptions we call a worldview. Our core desires and our core faith flavor our view of the world. They flavor how we approach our work. They determine how we treat other people. They shape 
what justice means. They show us what the purpose of the world is. They determine what the purpose of our own life is. The point is that faith matters to the whole of life and the whole of our being. We therefore believe that faith is not merely an individualistic and private matter, cut off from daily routines, cut off from work, our leisure, our politics, or our academics. Faith for us is a public matter. To keep issues of faith out of these areas is to live a divided life, and a life that denies the most important aspect of who we are. One of the main reasons I'm involved in interfaith activity is because I want to help create an environment and space in the public sphere, in this case at the University of Illinois, where a person's faith can be recognized and honored as part of who they are and what they do. And if faith is so important to me, well, maybe it's important to many others as well. I want to create the space so that all people can be whole persons in all that they do. More specifically, as my role as a pastor to students and faculty, my role is to enable and encourage them to shape their academic and professional lives by their commitment to Jesus and by a biblical Christian worldview so that they might be whole people who are wholly faithful to Christ. It would be unfaithful in my tradition to view oneself as a Christian in church on Sunday, but as a secular materialist in the lab on Monday. But if this is my goal for the members of my congregation, it is only just and fair that the environment I hope to foster also be open to people of other faith traditions and philosophical traditions. Loving our neighbors as ourselves dictates that people of all faith and philosophical traditions should be able to participate equally and openly in the public sphere from out of their own faith perspective. And beyond issues of faith and fairness, my tradition also encourages me to recognize that we as Christians and the public in general can benefit and learn from people of other faith traditions. All Christians will point to the Bible as our source of revelation about God. But the Calvinist tradition also stresses that there is a second book of revelation, God's creation. The Bible has authority over and is more reliable than this second book, but the Bible it itself teaches that the creation reveals the glory of God. All people, therefore, have access to some level of revelation from God. Moreover, we believe that all humans were made in the image of God. While we believe that sin distorts us and distorts our desires, we also believe that sin and evil are not so powerful as to have completely wiped out the foundational goodness of what God created in the first place. We should therefore expect that someone made in the image of God, living in a world that reveals God's glory, might have something to teach us and all people about the nature of God and the world in which we live. In short, I am driven toward interfaith work so that I and other Christians might be faithful to God in the public sphere, because justice and love demand that we seek this for others as well, and because I believe that this can also lead to the common good. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite uh, David Dash Keys up to share a brief reflection. So hi. As Ross said, my name is David Dashif and Keys. Uh, I am actually a staff person, an employee here at the University of Illinois. I do website work, so I am a complete nerd. That said, uh, uh, I also feel uh, very strongly toward uh, work that we're all here to discuss tonight. Um, my religious tradition is one that a lot of people don't necessarily have the opportunity to bump into very often. I'm a pagan, and as a pagan, uh, I am called to interfaith service for a variety of reasons. The first is that pagans believe that a diversity of strength 
or excuse me, a diversity of ideas brings strength to a community. That by sharing different ideas, by being able to see different viewpoints and share with each other the very same worldviews that Tim kind of just spoke of, it helps everyone to grow. It helps everyone to find truth in whatever way they are called to do so. So by sharing my own uh, path, by sharing my own ideas and the way that I live my life with others, it helps everyone to grow. It helps me to grow. It helps others to grow. That's all a good thing. Secondly, uh, as a pagan, we are called in whatever way we see to live righteously, to live with virtue. Uh, this is a far more vague commandment, for lack of a better term at the moment, than some of the others that people are familiar with, because righteousness and virtue are things that can be defined differently. So we're kind of back to a diversity of ideas, even within paganism. For me, righteous action means that I use my time and my talents in a way that can benefit people, that can help them. And as I said earlier, my talents tend toward being a complete nerd. So I write websites. So when I heard about this group, the first thing I showed up to do is offered to, hey, I will help everyone get online. I will help this get a website. I will go from there and we'll be good to go. And that's a starting point for me. That allows me to show up with talents that I have, things that I can bring to the table, and start from there to grow myself and learn so much uh, uh, over the course of the past year. So that, to me, is a righteous act, to show up to volunteer my time and my skills to do things for other people. Uh, the final thing that I'd like to comment on, too, is that, as I alluded to earlier, not many people have the opportunity to bump into a modern neo-pagan person. Uh, or if you do, sometimes you don't even know it. Uh, there are a lot of fairly common misconceptions about pagans and about paganisms. And so I think that by living my life in a way that is far more public than some people of minority religions are comfortable doing, uh, by sharing with you all here tonight what I do and who I am, I think it helps for all of us to understand that some of these things are misconceptions, that we, I can help to break down some of the walls that we've put up around faiths, whether it be paganism or anything else. Sometimes we all feel as if we are cut off from others because they think differently or because they believe differently, but through service and through action we can come together and we can do something, and through that action we can learn that we're all just people. And we might think differently, we might believe differently, we might go to a different church or a synagogue, or in my case, a small grove of trees in a forest, depending. Uh, so by sharing with everyone through service, we can all learn to be more tolerant, as the Chancellor mentioned, and to be connected in ways that we might not have been able to through any other vehicle. Thank you. I want to mention a few things that um, we have going on uh, this this weekend, um, and then I'll get out of the way. I, everybody wants to hear Jim speak, and so I'll I'll stop talking. Um, but uh, a few things that you may have seen flash by here. Um, for those of you who are plugged in, who are social media savvy, uh, Web 2.0 kinds of folks, um, who have a phone smarter than mine, um, we have uh, we have a Twitter handle as well as a hashtag. They're both ick ick. IC IC12. Um, so ICIC is our fond name for this conference. Um, so ICIC12 um, is if you want to tweet about tonight, if you want to talk about it, um, if you want to post about it on Facebook, we encourage you to do so um, and, and throughout the weekend. Um, that um, on, in addition, we are videotaping and we're taking photographs, um, not just so we can talk about this later, but also, especially for the videotaping, we want to be able to share this out with people who weren't able to be here tonight. So to, to share, so each of the workshops will be videotaped as well as the big uh, keynote time. So um, so that's that's something also for you to um, get connected with us so you can maybe um, see those later and share those out uh, at a later point. Um, and then finally, um, we do have a meditation and prayer space that we have reserved here in the Ark, as well as in Wohler's when we're at Wohler's Hall tomorrow. Um, in the Ark, in a room, um, in the small me uh, meeting room number two, go to the climbing wall on the lower level, and it's right next to it. So um, we're going to 
campus recreation. So that's what it looks like when we set up a meditation, meditation and prayer space here. But we do have very nice mats that we got to uh, make the floor a little nicer. So if, you, if you'd like to use our meditation and prayer space, it's meeting room number two on the concourse level next to the climbing wall. Um, so throughout this weekend, um, uh, we'll, we'll have more opportunities to have reflections like we heard today. Um, to, we also, um, this, this conference uh, couldn't be possible without the help from some of our wonderful friends at the Interfaith Youth Corps um, based out of Chicago. And um, the Interfaith Youth Corps' own Yusser Ghazi um, is here to share a little bit about what is, uh, what is uh, interfaith, what is religious pluralism, and also to introduce our speaker, Jim Wallace. So, uh, Yusser. Hello, everyone. Every year, over a million Muslims uh, travel to the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia for the Hajj pilgrimage as part of their religious practice as Muslims. And back in 1964, a very prominent Muslim American participated in this religious tradition. Malcolm X, one of my faith heroes, uh, left the United States with a reputation as a fiery, and divisive leader pitting blacks against whites, but came back after this experience to the United States with an eye-opening discovery. He realized after sharing meals at the Hajj pilgrimage with people from all sorts of races and ethnic backgrounds, that the diversity of the Muslim world is remarkable. He brought this appreciation for diversity back to the United States, this appreciation for the positive engagement of diversity, to the US as a proponent of the civil rights movement. And although I haven't been to Mecca for the Hajj pilgrimage myself, there was something similarly very transformative that I went through as a student in college. My whole life, I went to public schools. And so it was at DePaul University where I studied as an undergrad when I first got to befriend a Jewish woman who was in one of my classes. And this was also the first time that I got to organize interfaith service projects and found myself in conversations with students from all sorts of religious and non-religious backgrounds. It was at one particular service project when we were serving the refugee population and doing some uh, tutoring for young refugee children in Chicago when I was confronted with a question by some non-religious students who had uh, decided to join us for this service project. They said, Yusra, we do community service all the time. And so why is it important for us? We realize we've come here and we've participated with you, but why is it important for this to be interfaith collaboration? Why do we need to bring in religion and sort of muddle up this really wonderful experience? And to be totally honest, I struggled to answer that question. And I managed to speak from the heart about why as a Muslim I feel it's important. But over the years, the answer to this question has become more and more clear to me. Today, we live in a country with over 30 million young people, young Americans, with a remarkable diversity of religious affiliations. But that diversity in itself is a neutral value. And this is what Malcolm X realized on that Hajj pilgrimage he was at. That diversity that exists in our society can be engaged in a negative way, in a fiery, divisive way, or it can be engaged positively. And so this is why when he came back to the United States, he discovered that he could have a role in the civil rights movement. One of the most, if not the most, prominent leaders of the civil rights movement was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who very beautifully illustrates this concept by talking about the world's house. He says that we are inevitably a part of a very diverse community, a diverse society, and we have to learn to live together. And through his work, he welcomed Malcolm X, into this world house, to this beloved community. He welcomed the Jewish rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel into this community. He welcomed Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh into this community. And these leaders built a world house and the foundation of interfaith cooperation. As a campus engagement associate with the Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago, I talk about interfaith collaboration a lot, and it often um, to me and to my colleagues at IFYC comes in three parts. It starts with, and not necessarily in chronological order, the respect for religious and non-religious identities. Then mutually inspiring relationships. 
and common action for the common good. A lot of the stories you've heard so far from the folks who've come up on stage and talked about their personal experiences are about that respect, those relationships, and that common action. And in the sessions that you're a part of during this conference, you'll have a lot of these conversations. And I hope that this framework for what interfaith collaboration is will be helpful to you and helpful in thinking about the types of collaborations and the positive engagement we discuss during this conference.